Camilla Mondo, and you are watching On the Road with Carmilla. Today we are in Washington, D.C. at the Jesuit Academy with Marcus Washington. He is the head of the Jesuit Academy School, and we are waiting the arrival of James Brown, the sportscaster. But first, we want to talk to the headmaster, Marcus. Tell us about your school. Thank you very much. Um, the Washington Jesuit Academy, we are happy to say that we're celebrating our 10th anniversary here in Washington, D.C. It was established by our president, William Whitaker, and he established the school because he was an admissions director over at Gonzaga, and he saw that a lot of the kids who came to Gonzaga from the inner city weren't as well prepared as they possibly could. So he decided to establish a school in Washington, D.C., where the young men would be prepared, not only academically, but socially, and put them in an environment to be very successful in. And that's why the Washington Jesuit Academy is 11 months out of the year, 12 hours a day. Now, this is an all-male school. Yes. It's an all-male school because we were founded by the Jesuits, and the Jesuits have done a great job of educating men, and that's sort of the background of the school. And also, given where the state of a lot of the African-American and Latino males are in our society, we wanted to really focus on putting them in the best position to be successful. Now, what have been some of your greatest successes out of this school? Um, I think our successes really uh, are can be measured in the fact that I think 84% of our graduates are currently in college, and we'll put that number up against any number in there out there in most inner city schools. And I just think seeing the character of our graduates and seeing the way our graduates consistently come back and 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 they're and their testimonies of what Washington Jesuit Academy did for it. Ultimately, I think that is how we measure our success. Now, how are you different than any other private school? We're different than other private schools in the fact that our population is distinctly different and in the fact that our 12 hours a day, but more importantly, the relationships that are formed here. In that, our teachers, we have a very, very small environment, no more than 14 kids in a class. and. The way that we know our boys on a personal level and an academic level, I think, is is immeasurable and distinctly different than any other private school. Now, you're anticipating uh, mm -hmm. the arrival of Mr. James Brown, the yes. sportscaster at CBS. Mm -hmm. Are you excited about this? I'm very excited. I grew up as a young man, it's very similar to these to these boys here at the Washington Jazz Academy, watching James Brown on television and just hearing his story all throughout the neighborhood from going to the math and from going to Harvard. It, it's really an honor to have someone like that come back and talk to our boys. Well, thank you, Mr. Washington, and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. I'm sitting here with Kevin Wheeler. He's one of the students here at Jesuit Academy. Kevin, welcome. Oh, thank you. Tell us, what do you like about this school? Um, it's a good academic school. It teaches you what you need to know about about when you grow up in life and how you save your money. Um, this school, when you graduate, you go to a good high school and end up at a good college. So, really? So that your inspiration is to go to high school? Yes, that's Actually. my inspiration is to be a successful man. And you want to go to college? Yes. So what do you want to study? Um, right now, I'm looking at uh, math, geometry. So is that your favorite subject, math? Yes. So what are your grades like? Oh, I have a 3.8. Oh, well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> is that because you come to this school, or? Um, yes, I think, because in my old school, I was lazy. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do work or anything. But after I came here, um, they taught me how, what to do and make the make good grades. So that's why I started taking those keys and end up my grades are becoming better. So math is your forte. That's what you're really good at. Yes. Yeah. So what do you like to do for fun? Basketball and football. Basketball and football? Yes. Have you ever heard of James Brown, a sportscaster? Yes. So what did you say to other kids who might be having some trouble in school or may not think that education is a value? What, you, what would you say to them? Um, you don't want to end up on the street. Um, you want to, you want to set your goal as a as a high as a high thing. Right. And if you want to succeed to do low, you can do that. But if you want to succeed and do high, that's a good thing, and you need to set your goal to do that. Thank you, Kevin, and good Thank luck you. to you. Thank you. And now we go to Mr. James Brown. This will tell us about your <clears throat> upbringing in D.C. Native Washingtonian, like you, Carmela. Mm -hmm. uh, proudly, I claim my heritage. I was born over in uh, southeast D.C., uh, near 3rd and K Street, mm -hmm. southeast. Uh, the old Washington Star Building was over there. And um, 
You know, I, w I was telling some students earlier with whom I had the, the pleasure of speaking and to whom that um, back in the day, you know, it, it was not unusual to see two-parent households in our community. Prior to integration, that was the name of the game where we had folks in our neighborhood. And Carmela, it didn't make any difference whether the head of household was a garbage worker, and I knew one who is one of the proudest guys I've ever met, and I don't mean in a negative sense, but took care of his family, respectful, always clean and sharp, um, you know, was just a wonderful man, as well as having doctors, lawyers, and school teachers in the community. So it was a wonderful environment uh, that I grew up in over there in Southeast uh, with my mother and father, God bless them, and uh, I'm a proud Washingtonian. I'm excited to be involved with the baseball team today because the stadium is about five blocks from where I grew up. So there were some personal connections as to why I wanted to be involved with the Nationals, but that's down the road when you get to that. So Now, mm -hmm. when you look back on your childhood and mm -hmm. you see how we were brought up mm -hmm. with our parents, and even if our parents, the neighborhood itself was involved, mm -hmm. does it sadden you to see how now these kids are growing up really without even a mother or a father? Carmela, you're absolutely correct. Hey, and I'm sure you can relate to this as well, too. Our parents were the law, number one. What they said went. Uh, we practiced what the Bible said, and when they, even if their parents had to beat it into us, you know, uh, to honor thy mother and thy father. There were no conditions on that. It just says honor them, period. Number two, you talk about the community being involved. Yeah, and I know while uh, Secretary of State uh, Hillary um, Clinton certainly talked about it takes a village to raise a kid, we lived that when we were growing up. Because if you did something out of the way, three or four blocks from home, not only might you have gotten a spanking by Mr. Gilmore around the corner, he called and before you got back home, your folks knew what, was, what had happened, and you got another bit of discipline, whether it was a whipping or being punished or what have you. So it truly was a community that raised us. But I think, and again, it wasn't a matter of child abuse. It was making certain that we understood respect, uh, what our roles were to be, uh, and, and the whole nine yards. And I think a lot of us have had that uh, internalized to the degree that we hopefully show that same level of respect today. What do you think has happened? Because these mm. young people, <clears throat> I, I, I just had my friend tell me that her son was assaulted and they videotaped it. You know, what has happened in our communities? <sighs> You know what, I don't profess to be a sociologist uh, to understand the definitive reasons, but having lived a fairly long life uh, and, and full life, and I'm sure you could speak to this as well, too. Uh, I haven't speaks, lived as long as you. No, you haven't. <laughs> she wanted to make sure she got that clearly right. out there, you understand? So, no, Carmela is probably about 30 years younger than me, so... <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure we get that right. Yeah. I want the interviewer yes. feeling good about this. That's right. But, you know, it, it, it's our culture today where it seems like everybody's just concerned about doing what they want to do. The media plays a major role in that in perpetuating a real shallowness of, of, of mentality, um, of philosophy. It's all about the superficial, you know, getting the latest clothes, um, um, promoting change all the time. You know, if it's not working here, go do that. And there's an awful lot to be said about being steady and consistent when you're standing on values and principles that are tried and true. Let me word it this way. My high school coach um, shared with me when I told him that I was going to be talking with some youngsters. I said, Coach, as you just got finished reminding me, I'm a lot older now. I said, I'm talking to these youngsters. You know, what can I say that's a little different than, than, than what we were taught? And he said, you know what? There's no such thing <clears throat> as new fundamentals. Hmm. What's tried and true, what was tried and true then, is still tried and true now. Yeah. So you stand on those fundamentals, because he says most kids want discipline, and they want to understand what's the best route to go about things, and it's not running around with itchy ears or looking for satisfaction here and looking for satisfaction there. The Bible talks about uh, being mature in the Word and not being tossed around by every wind of doctrine, running here and running there being firmly planted like a tree by the rivers of water. 
You know, so that's what we're supposed to be about, and you don't see a lot of that today. There's a lot of situational ethics, if you will. Well, what's the situation? And I'll tell you whether or not this is right. No, you know what? Truth and honesty and transparency and all those things, treating your neighbors, loving your neighbors as you love yourself, esteeming others above yourself, those are tried and true principles that work no matter whether it was 100 years ago or 100 years from now. Do you think, when you, you mentioned the media, you said the media plays a, a big role in that? Commercials that you see all the time, you know. We use sex to sell virtually everything, from automobiles to uh, the kind of coffee that you drink. I mean, come on, so, and you wonder why we maybe have a problem with teenage pregnancies, um, you know, uh, a preponderance of pregnancies in, in, in uh, lower class such uh, circumstances, you know, lower economic um, uh, situ situations, you know, well, that's all that we're being bombarded with is that sex is the answer. You have young ladies being awfully concerned about how they are or trying to please a guy and in their preteen years. I mean, give me a break. So that's all you're being bombarded with. So that's what I'm talking about when I say a shallowness in terms of what's being perpetuated in the media. We have to really be grounded and also be mindful of the kind of things that we get bombarded with. The standards of beauty that they suggest on television for young ladies. You know what? We've got a range of beautiful young ladies out there that come in every shade in between from coal black to the whitest white and everything in between and there's beauty to be associated with it all and especially beauty on the inside but you don't hear those kinds or aren't um, uh, um, being being um, hit with that kind of message on a daily basis as opposed to the superficial. Mm -hmm. Do you feel as a part of the media mm -hmm. that you're responsible for portraying a positive image? Of Absolutely. It? I have a role in that. And my little, and the same as what you're doing with your television show, Carmela, we have a responsibility, I think. This is me. Many may disagree with me. But in our little sphere of influence, to the degree that we understand what is truth and what is tried and proven to be accurate and successful in raising a healthy a group of young people, then we're responsible to make certain that we are perpetuating that in terms of how we do things. Now, I know as a reporter, we have to report what is if we're interviewing somebody. <clears throat> but when we have an opportunity to offer our opinion, to give a commentary, uh, the kind of material that we select, the kind of people that we select to interview, I think that's our role, and we can certainly be a positive influence in that regard. But there are sports mm -hmm. players who say, I'm not responsible for raising your kids. Mm -hmm. That's your responsibility. What do you mm -hmm. say to them? And in truth, that may well be the case in terms of them not being directly involved on an ongoing basis. Parents, <clears throat> guardians, those of us who have daily roles with the young people do have a big role in helping to put in perspective, in context, what our kids are seeing on, t on television or in sports. However, and Charles Barkley uh, was one who was famous for saying that, and Charles and I had a chance to talk about this where he says, hey, I'm not a role model. His aim for that was to force dialogue because he does believe that he is, in fact, responsible in terms of how he handles himself. My attitude has always been, if you are a public figure, being a role model comes with the territory. There's no choice in the matter. You are a role model because you do influence people by virtue of what you portray on TV. There will be a legions of fans who follow you. Now, you may choose not to take that responsibility and say, you know what, I'm going to live my life the way I feel, and if that's what they want to do and follow me, then so be it. But it does have consequences. It comes with the territory. It's not your choice. Why are the most popular sports <clears throat> fears some of the most nastiest sports figures. They're, they've done some crude things or rude things or they, they're involved in these uh, affairs with these, you know, see these women. But they are the ones that the world is, mm -hmm. is admiring. How is that so? They're the ones that the world what now? The world admires. Yeah, and, and that's exactly my point in terms of the media. If it admires them and gives them a lot of airtime, that's precisely what I meant about how the media perpetuates this shallowness, if you will, or that which they think is on, on the cutting edge or that which the public wants, you know, has an insatiable appetite for. You know what? Okay, well, fine, if that's what you think, but it does have consequences. And I would dare say that the majority of athletes are not like that, at least in my experience in being involved in the NFL 
and even the NBA. And I know there are stereotypes associated with each that you will hear the late night comedians uh, bandy about it and banter about as well too. But the ab the the um, the um, unfortunate behavior of the aberrant few is what gets and garners most of the attention. But if you look at the raw numbers, again, they are a smaller percentage of the players. If there are 1,900 players in the NFL, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't know, less than, less than 100, less than 50, whatever it is. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head who may be engaged in the kind of behavior that you're talking about, but they get most of the headlines. Mm. How mm -hmm. do we change it? I think to the degree of um, that, that we as, as those who are involved in the media are more responsible in determining and making a judgment. You know, is this really something? We have a job to cover whatever's taking place. That I get. But to what degree? How many details are really important to make the point? Do we need to engage in reporting um, a preponderance of salacious details? Some of that is only feeding the tabloid mentality that many folks have. I think if we're doing our jobs as reporters, the facts are very important, clearly, to relate to what's going on. But in terms of making better judgments about what needs to be reported, I, I think that's on us. There's such a desire right now because of the overwhelming number of media outlets out there. And because of the Internet, and you don't need to be a part of a big news organization, you can just go with your, with your, with your smartphone and record some video and audio to it as well, too. And there's a desire by everybody to be the first you know, quickly to run to the table as opposed to the old school notion of, hey, check that with two or three sources first mm -hmm. and vet it and then determine properly, as objectively and as fairly as you can, what's important in this story to relate as opposed to just letting it all hang out. In this day and time, you've got cameras all in your face everywhere you go, catching you in all kinds of circumstances at reality TV. I mean, my gosh, look, and it's got to be, it is impacting the culture in terms of what they see. Young, impressionable minds who are watching any and everything, and if as parents or responsible adults, we aren't helping to put that in context, then the consequences are those that we are seeing now. How are you working to help change some of these things? One of the things that I do, and I'm not trying to put myself up as, as a holier-than-thou person, but in terms of how I was raised and what I'd like to think is the fact that we are all role models and we do impact people as well. Some of the things I get involved with, I've been blessed to have worked with the NFL Players Association for the past 8 to 10 years uh, with their annual awards event that's now called the Pulse Awards, but it features a segment called the JB Awards. And I recognize those players who are doing meaningful things not just on the field, but off the field, contributing to building stronger families in the communities where they work and stronger communities where they work, giving of themselves. They don't want to be given the, that kind of recognition because they do it for all the right reason, but I think it, reasons, but I think it's important to recognize them because then the young players who are coming up behind them will see, oh, so that really means something. They're being recognized. You know, it's, it's, we are really followers. And young athletes coming into the big time with all the money that they're going to be making, all the visibility, cameras and microphones in their faces everywhere, every action of theirs is being recorded uh, and documented. It's important to understand that you are a brand and that you do have an impact. And that brand is whatever you develop it to be as well, too. So I try to make certain that we reinforce it positively by giving them recognition for what they do well. When I'm on TV, if there's something that takes place in the world of sports that moves me, Thank God I'm given the opportunity, and I use it judiciously, to come up and give a commentary on television about things that I'm seeing to put it in context. I have to run it by my boss to make certain they understand, but if I feel something passionately, then I want to speak on it, and I do, and I will. Now, you mm -hmm. talk about sports. Many people see you announcing, but they don't know you played sports for us younger people. So t let's talk about your career. Carmilla's <laughs> going to drive that younger boy home, right? Is she not? You know what? Hey, Carmilla, sense. despite the size and girth that yes. you see here now, many people assume because I've been so closely identified over the past however many years, yeah. 20 years plus with the NFL, mm -hmm. that I played football. Mm -hmm. Well, believe it or not, there was a time when I was skinny. Mm -hmm. In high school, I think I graduated at about 195 pounds, mm -hmm. and uh, now I'm knocking at about 285 pounds, you know? <laughs> But you look good, though. Well, I appreciate it, though. And I don't even have any spikes on either. All so. right, all right. But, um, so sports was a major part of, of my upbringing, 
uh, and, and, and I'm glad that I did play sports because I got a chance to, to see the world as a result of it, use that God-given talent to be able to go to college. Uh, so that was, you know, some people have a great gift as uh, being a piano player, a uh, great mathematician and what have you. Mine was, uh, was basketball, and I'm very thankful for that. But I've been so closely identified with sports. And even though I'm on the periphery of sports because I didn't get a chance to realize my dream of playing professional basketball, drafted by the Atlanta Hawks in the NBA, and the reason I didn't make it is because I got complacent, started mm -hmm. resting on my laurels, when I got to college, I didn't apply the same work ethic as I did in high school to become one of the best high school players in the country and to be recruited by every ma most major colleges in the country and had an opportunity to use that skill to come to their attention. But I didn't work it the same way with the same work ethic when I got to college. And, hey, the Bible says you reap what you sow. That is true. So I tell kids today, you've got to build a solid foundation because that foundation that you build will determine how, you, how high you go in the game of life. And because I didn't work as hard in college, when I got drafted by the Atlanta Hawks, I was one of the last players cut. But I couldn't blame anybody else but me. And when I looked in the mirror, I realized what my mistake was. And I vowed, Carmilla that I would never allow an opportunity that I wanted to pursue badly to escape me or escape my grasp because I wasn't prepared, that I would pay the price. So yeah, I know I work hard now. You've been exceedingly patient, even waiting for us to have this blessing of an opportunity to chat. So I have rightly been accused of being a workaholic, but because I know I rested on my laurels, when the game of life is over for me, I want to know I gave it my very best. And in terms of my faith foundation, that is the solid rock upon which I am built. Um, I, you and many people don't know you're, you're a minister. Praise God. And I'm, I'm very thankful to be an ordained minister uh, in that regard because I realize that all truth is parallel. That which is true in the natural is true in the supernatural. We have bosses that we answer to here that we work for on earth. We will have a boss that we will answer to at the end of our days here to give account of every word that came out of our mouth and what we've done. So I want to make certain that I'm found faithful in doing that. So each day that I go about doing my job, I try to make certain that whatever I do, Carmela, I do it excellently unto the Lord, that I give it my best. If I'm working for you and you ask me to do A through Z, if I do it excellently unto the Lord, I'm going to please you because I will have done my job superbly. I also want to make certain even as I do in the world of broadcasting, I work with colleagues. I want to esteem them above myself. So I want to make sure that I know everything about the sport and know what their strengths and weaknesses are so I can play to them and to the degree that I have some influence on the broadcast that I set them up to look the best to provide the insight for those who are listening. That's how I try to go about it. I'll never forget being cut by the Atlanta Hawks and because I did not give it my best in preparation, I want to make certain that I'm found faithful and being um, being true to my profession and working hard so that I can do my job excellently unto him. Now let me say mm -hmm. this, and, yes, and I'm not just saying this because you're on my show. Yes, you have been absolutely professional. Your staff has been professional, okay. consistent with me, being okay. very uh, just supportive of what I do, and I am so grateful that we had this opportunity to actually meet finally. Okay. And this is why I wanted you on the show. I okay. read your book, and I was just mm. totally inspired by it. Mm -hmm. And you bring truth and honesty with the fire of God with you, and I really think young people need to see and hear that nowadays. Yes, and I thank you for taking your busy time, mm. this busy schedule, to come mm. and talk to a little old girl like me, mm. and I really do appreciate it. Hey, Carmilla, let me just say this, and I say this the bottom of my heart as well too because I wanted so much for this to happen. I thank you for your patience. I know at times I have not learned to manage my schedule a little better but I remember what it was like when I was working my way up and people who gave me an opportunity and poured into me and I will never forget that. So no, if I ever act like I've gotten too big for my britches, I give you permission to smack me wherever you see me. I, I just want to make sure that I am hopefully doing as much for you as you are for me and that this message will go out and touch some hearts as well too. And I thank you for your patience from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Okay. God bless you. God bless you too, Carmilla. You were, I see that. I knew you'd be professional and get this done. No, even with the truncated time, I knew you'd get it done. This was awesome. I appreciate oh. it.
Foundation. The show was going to be centered around helping young people in video and entertainment. But what happened was something much bigger than what I expected. Well, I had an opportunity to interview some of the biggest entertainers, politicians, and businessmen in the world. I was able to interview Chris Tucker. The positive things in our community, the affecting our young people. Tell us why you're here. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're here, I'm hosting tonight, and uh, Dream Academy is a great foundation, a great academy, they do a lot with kids, uh, at-risk kids, and uh, I'm just happy to be a part of it. On Strong Williams. They can find the good, and plus, the other thing is, that there are many people you know that you speak of today, it does have that care. Don't that's what may, may come from a broken home, but yet to go to school and get the best grade. Mike Roberts. That my children just know some of the concepts and secrets and strategies. And businessman Don Peoples. However, you have managed to be more successful at business than some minorities. Yeah, you know, I actually had the great fortune of really starting my business career. Um, in 1979. So that was a time period, uh, especially in this region and around the country where we were post-civil rights. I would love to interview Tyler Perry, Oprah Winfrey, and sportscaster James Brown, and the Wizards owner, Ted Leone. The goal is to encourage and motivate viewers with inspiring stories to help transform their lives. Generation is an organization designed to help young people become productive adults. I started Saving Generation um, after my nephew was murdered. It was birthed out of a lot of pain. I saw that there was a need for young people to have activities in our community. So I took on the ownership and the responsibility to create this organization. We have life skills, we have mentorship, we have uh, outings and trips to showcase our young people that there is an alternative to crime and drugs and that they do not have to be prison to the community in which they live in. Our ultimate goal is to impact children in our community. If I'm able to change the life of one child, I believe I'm saving a generation.